Don't forget that you can now listen to the Politocrat podcast on Audible at audible.com and wherever you get your podcasts. Please subscribe now and thank you for your support. Welcome to the Politocrat. I am Omar Moore. It is Sunday, December the 20th, 2020. You can either bury yourself under the duvet and think I'm giving up now, or you can think, in spite of all of that, life remains an unbelievably precious gift and I choose to savour every moment and make the most of it, however constrained the circumstances. And I sort of felt when the pandemic hit, I had a few weeks, actually, a couple of weeks, two or three weeks of feeling as if I was on another planet from everyone else because I remember walking around where I live in London and thinking don't you understand what's going to happen you know the the news had hit it had hit this country in a small way and people were joking about it and people were carrying on as normal and I thought don't you realize this is life sort of over now for we don't know how long maybe a few years I don't know and I remember in the green room at Sky News as you know I, I review the papers on Sky usually a couple of times a month. And I was on with somebody who said, oh, it's just like flu, you know, nothing to worry about. And I I, howl, I burst into tears in the green room and I just howled. And I thought, how can you say that? And I had a vision that I was going to be the only person kind of locked away at, with my partner who I, you know, understandably don't want to die, having lost my entire family. And I thought, my goodness, everybody's going to carry on as usual, and people are going to die in vast numbers because the mass simply says that that's the case. So the original projections were about half a million. We don't still don't know the exact percentage, but say it's 1% of the population. In this country, that would be 670,000 people. On this edition of The Politocrat, a conversation with the writer, journalist, author, commentator, activist, and podcaster, Christina Patterson. Christina Patterson is based in the United Kingdom in England. And we will be conversing about what is going on in England in particular with Boris Johnson and COVID-19 restrictions and the different tiers that have been administered throughout England. Plus, We will also talk about Christina Patterson's book entitled The Art of Not Falling Apart, as well as other conversational bits that we have. So please join us right after this. With me on this edition of the Politocrat Daily Podcast is the one and only Christina Patterson. She is an author, broadcaster, podcaster, journalist, writer, and an activist as well. She's written a number of stories in The Independent back in 2013 about the horrors of nursing and the industry and the kinds of abuses that were going on and in the industry opened a lot of people's eyes in the independent she has a podcast which i strongly recommend to you it is called work interrupted rethinking work in a pandemic it's available on apple and podbean some great conversations there that christina has including one of the ones i listened to most recently with margaret heffernan who transitioned from doing work in television and producing uh, to become a tech entrepreneur. That is a fascinating conversation. That's the first one everybody should listen to. The Art of Not Falling Apart is one of her books, and I want to ask her one or two things about that and an upcoming book that she has. Plus, not to mention, what is going on with the COVID-19 restrictions and Boris Johnson's handling of all that? All of that is to say, Christina Patterson, welcome to the Politocrat Podcast. 
Thank you so much. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with you this morning. Of course, as a Brit, I feel horribly oversold now by your uh, American enthusiasm. I feel <laughs> like I have to deny all of it, but, um, but I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually originally from England. I, I miss being there. Uh, I normally go really? back every year. And um, again, your tree, your Christmas tree is absolutely lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a Swedish influence, actually. My mother was Swedish. And uh, and uh, when we were children, um, we always had straw decorations and white lights. And we would kind of beg and bully my mother so we could have tinsel and baubles like all our friends. And she wouldn't give in. Uh, and now everybody has, well, not everybody, but lots of people have these rather tasteful Scandinavian trees. <laughs> Where are you? Where do you? Where are you from in England? Um, do you know where Pinner is? Pinner Middlesex. Yes, it's just course, a kind of, course, of northwest yeah. London area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've done an amazing job with your accent because uh, nobody would know you were from Pinner now. No, um, no. I think, I think Jan, I think Danny Finkelstein from the Times is also from Pinner. Yes, he is. I actually had a conversation with him on this podcast a few months back. Did so, you? Yes, yes, He's a lovely indeed. Man. Yeah, he certainly is. He certainly is. It was an absolute delight talking to him. Um, and 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 where are you? Are you in northern north in northern England? Well, at the moment we're in Northampton. Right. Um, normally, I live in Hackney in London in Stoke Newington. Um, my my partner, um, his house is in Northamptonshire in the countryside. And since the first lockdown hit, we normally move between my flat and his cottage. Um, and since March. Given that I can't see anyone really or do anything or do any work in London, we've been here because it's rather nicer to be in a house with a garden, which we're very, very privileged to have. Then uh, I think we'd have killed each other if we'd been nine months together in my flat now. So um, I'm glad we haven't. <laughs> oh, dearie me, my, my microphone again. <laughs> oh, these troublesome microphones. Oh, dear. You know, I... Oh my gosh, let me just fix this here. <laughs> Let's get this fixed. Okay, that's better. Um, <laughs> so it is, it's really wonderful to see you. And I wanted to start off, Christina, by asking you about your book, The Art of Not Falling Apart. That is a terrific title for a book. Um, I would Thank like you. you to talk about the book and what prompted you to write it. Hmm. Well, I mean, we all uh, we all face challenges in life don't we and sometimes we can get quite near to feeling as though we are falling apart and uh, for me the trigger actually was losing my job which was now eight years ago I was very lucky to have a fantastic job at the independent I was a writer and columnist there and then one day I was called into the editor's office and uh, he told me that he wanted to freshen the pages up and I walked out of the office feeling I'd lost the thing I'd spent my whole life building up. I was single. I didn't have children. Work was the thing I had given my life and time to. And friends. I mean, I I wouldn't say I was a workaholic in that I had nothing else in my life, but work really, really mattered to me. And when I lost my identity, the fruits of my labours in terms of doing the thing that made my heart sing. I always wanted to be a writer. It took me a long, long time to become a journalist. I became, I got my job at The Independent when I was 39, having done all kinds of other things and having done freelance writing on top of full-time jobs for many, many years. And I was shattered by it. And I was shocked by how shattered I was by it because I'd had a lot of other things go wrong in my life. My sister died when... She was 41, uh, then my father died. Um, I'd had cancer a couple of times. I'd had a, quite a bad autoimmune disease in my 20s and was very crippled with that. Uh, I was often quite distressed about not having met someone and not having had a family and felt like a bit of a failure on that front. But the thing that really made me feel absolutely like a failure was losing my job. And so I set out to talk to people about how they had coped when life had gone wrong for them. And the result is a kind of collection of my story and my family's story woven through with the stories of about 25 other people I spoke to. So it's, it's not a self-help book and it's not 
um, unfortunately, it can't give anybody, you know, kind of 10 easy steps to not falling apart because, as we know, life isn't like that. But it is um, really an exploration of how humans cope when we suffer, which we all do, and what we can learn from those who have done it with grace and humour. And um, it was huge fun to write it. And I'm, I'm very pleased to say that a lot of people write to me to say that it's really helped them and cheered them up. And for me, as a writer, that's kind of as much as you want to do. Absolutely. And I, I look forward to reading your book as well. I'm actually going to uh, purchase it and, um, and read it. Absolutely. And I will be also providing a link uh, in the podcast episode as well so that people can can link to it and, and order it. It's, it's, it's something I look forward to reading. Um, you have another book that you are in the works on, and I would like you to say a few things about that particular book and and when Mm. that's coming out so that people can look out for it thank you well it's i have written the first draft it's with the publisher at the moment and it's due out in february 2022 and i had a very poignant experience uh, a few weeks ago because i was actually arriving at the cemetery where my sister and my parents are buried and I was about to inter my brother's ashes. He died suddenly of a heart attack last summer. And uh, and the news came through on my phone that my book was being published by Tinder Press. Obviously, I knew it was being published, but it hadn't been announced publicly. And it was a very, very poignant thing. On the day that I was burying the last member of my family in the family grave, um, that the book, which is about my family, it's a, a family memoir, called Outside the Sky is Blue, that that should be announced. And again, it's kind of looking at this whole theme of what makes for a successful life. I know that my parents wanted children who got married and had families and were successful according to the traditional criteria of success. And when my sister was 14, she had a breakdown and was subsequently diagnosed with schizophrenia. And her illness cast a very heavy shadow over the whole family. My brother, in some ways, battled with anxiety. I mean, he was he, he was a really wonderful person. They were all absolutely wonderful people. And, um, and, you know, none of us did the thing that our parents wanted us to do. However, I think, I argue in the book, that we, we were brought up to believe that the most important thing in life was to be a decent person and to be kind and to look after other people and to take pleasure and joy in the small things in life. And I think my father was a civil servant. Uh, my mother was a teacher. They absolutely believed in public service. I believe in public service. And I believe ultimately that actually they were very special people and they were extraordinarily successful at the true challenge in life, which is to respond to this complex, baffling business of being alive on this complex, baffling, beautiful planet with courage and grace. And I think they all did that. And I want to say that I, I'm really so sorry for your, for your loss of your brother. Thank and- you your sister and you know um you've gone through a lot um a lot and Thank and, you. and um i must must say that and and also you're inspiring and helping a lot of people um the kind of courage and the kind of inspiration you have um even with all of these very difficult things that you've experienced is helping you must know that this is helping a lot of people out there I, that's very kind of you to say. I, I doubt that. I don't think it's helping a lot of people. And I'm not sure that I'm any more courageous than anybody else. I think life throws things at us and and we, you know, we don't really have much choice. You can either bury yourself under the duvet and think I'm giving up now, or you can think in spite of all of that, life remains an unbelievably precious gift and I choose to savor every moment and make the most of it, however constrained the circumstances. And I sort of felt when the pandemic hit, I had a few weeks, actually, a couple of weeks, two or three weeks of feeling as if I was on another planet from everyone else. Because I remember walking around where I live in London and 
thinking, don't you understand what's going to happen? You know, they, we, the news had hit, it had hit this country in a small way and people were joking about it and people were carrying on as normal. And I thought, don't you realise this is life sort of over now for, we don't know how long, maybe a few years, I don't know. And I remember in the green room at Sky News, as you know, I, I review the papers on Sky usually a couple of times a month. And I was on with somebody who said, oh, it's just like flu, you know, nothing to worry about. And I, I, howl, I burst into tears in the green room and I just howled. And I thought, how can you say that? And I had a vision that I was going to be the only person kind of locked away with my partner who I, you know, understandably don't want to die having lost my entire family. And I thought, my goodness, everybody's going to carry on as usual and people are going to die in vast numbers because the mass simply says that that's the case. So the original projections were about half a million. We don't, still don't know the exact percentage, but say it's 1% of the population. In this country, that would be 670,000 people. I mean, that's a lot of people. And apart from anything else, our mortuaries and our hospitals simply couldn't cope with that volume, even if you were inhumane enough to think that was an acceptable price for normal life. So at that point in the pandemic, I thought, I thought, I felt as if I was on a different planet. And then, of course, and, and our Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, was refusing to do much about it. He was basically telling us, wash your hands and sing happy birthday. And I was thinking, that's not really going to cut it. Um, and then, of course, too late, because unfortunately, he always acts too late. Um, he did introduce a national lockdown. And then everybody realised, well, I was going to say everybody realised how serious this was. Unfortunately, many people still don't. I mean, I've had abusive emails since simply from being on Sky last night saying, don't you realise this hardly affects anybody? And I mean, full of swear words and the selfishness. I find the selfishness and the denial of people absolutely breathtaking. Um, but all of that is a very long winded way of saying I sort of felt like I had my own pandemic before the pandemic hit because I loved my whole family and lost them. And um and so for me, although I've been heartbroken to see what's happened to other people, um, it hasn't personally been that difficult for me. I don't have a job to lose anymore. Many people are losing their jobs. I'm freelance and, um, you know, I've been lucky enough to write my book this year. Writers don't earn very much, but, you know, I'm OK. I don't need a lot of money. I don't want a lot of money. But um, I... You know, I've been safe. I've been well. I do know people who've lost parents to COVID. I know people who've got long COVID. I know people who've been profoundly affected by it. But I've been in the very lucky position of being safe and well and able to do something in safely without having to risk my health or that of other people. So it hasn't personally been a hard year for me. But the simple scale of human suffering that we've all been exposed to visually and orally and reading about it and observing it, has been breathtaking. And I'm, I fear that the trauma that this will leave, particularly for children and young people, is absolutely enormous. The mental health aspect, and this is something I was going to touch on before we started to talk about Boris Johnson and what's mm. happened. The mental health component is going to be so incredibly, so many like mm. overwhelming, important, key. This is going to be something that all of us are going to be feeling for so long. Yes. And we're going to still be living through this as yes, we're going exactly. to go through the mental health processes. And, mm, it, exactly. and and it's going to go on and the education is going to be mm. a test. And you've talked about this just now with what you see in your emails, these horribly ab abusive emails you've just spoken about. Mm. And the vaccines are going to be here You've got these strains we don't know for sure yet. And people are going to say, oh, I got my jab. I can throw away this mask. You're going to have that contingent. Then mm. you're going to have people say, oh, I don't believe in vaccines. You're going mm. to have so many different cross sections. And the mental health component around all of that. How do yes. we swim through that? Christina, mm. that's just so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, obviously, as you know, as the world guru and everything, my simple answer is A, B, C, D. I have no idea. It's, it's, it's a nightmare. And it's very early. It was in March that I was taking part in an online salon, so-called. It wasn't a salon. Obviously, it was us all sitting in front of our computers, which is all anyone's social life is these days. And as someone I hugely respect, she's a, an eminent publisher, wealthy announced, when I said, you know, we just got to pray for a vaccine now, this was in, 
probably late March. And she said, oh, I, I'm not very keen on the vaccine. And that was the moment it hit me. I thought, oh, my God, it had never occurred to me that if we were lucky enough that our incredible scientists would have produced, or if they did come up with a vaccine, there was no guarantee then that they would. We knew they were working on it, but there are many diseases. Uh, HIV still doesn't have a vaccine after 40 years. Um, there was no guarantee we would get one. But if by some absolute miracle we got a vaccine, at that point, it hadn't occurred to me that people would refuse it. And now, of course, it's a huge worry because if we don't meet the threshold, um, then this thing will never, ever go away. And because it is so unbelievably infectious and spread so quickly and so dangerous, I mean, yes, most people obviously don't die, uh, quite a lot get long COVID. I've had a lot of illness in my life, so I'm not the least bit relaxed about getting um, something that is essentially like ME. I mean, it get, you know, it could, we don't know. It could go on for years, and we do know that it causes damage to lungs and organs. I don't want that, thanks very much. I don't want to give that to anybody else, but that will continue on a big scale if not enough people have the vaccines. And I do understand that people are nervous that they have been approved quickly. But I think what a lot of people don't understand is that the, the safety procedures have not been sped up. The safety procedures are exactly as they normal are, are, are normally. The trials have been, have been quicker than, than usual because of the scale of the disease and because the infection rate is so high. So nothing has been rushed through in an unsafe way. These vaccines are safe. And anyone who, in my view, who refuses to be vaccinated, unless they have an incredibly strong health reason endorsed by a medical professional not to have one, is, I'm afraid, being incredibly unselfish to other people. It's something that is a huge problem. And I, I can say, and I would like to uh, get your take on this, Christina, um, there are communities who have had a history um, of some really horrible government experimentation, mm -hmm. black communities and other yeah. uh, communities as well. Uh, and there are segments of those communities, as you know, who understandably have some skepticism mm -hmm. or some concern. Um, uh, how, how would you square something like that in, in your analysis of what you've just said? Well, I think the, the so-called anti-vaxxers break up into a lot of different groups. The one I probably have least time for is um, the kind of yummy mummies who like their lavender oil and think it's somehow unnatural to, um, to have, uh, you know, to avail yourself of uh, the brain work of human beings. I, I think, you know, that a lot of those are quite well off the middle class and I'm afraid I have zero tolerance for their view. But in terms, for example, of in your country, African-Americans, I know that there have been uh, dreadful shameful blots on medical history. A, a friend of mine who is a nursing professor went to, I'm trying to remember the university, it's a university with a very high proportion of African Americans and um, they've done a lot of research and work into um, some of the most shameful trials. I, you'll, I'm sure you'll know the ones I'm talking about. It's been quite recent history in the last sort of 40, 50 years. It's a skeaky experiment, that, perhaps. Exactly, yes, exactly, yes, thank you. Um, and that that is, you know, they were a complete scandal and a blot on any country's conscience. But this is not that. And I think what will have to happen is that respected members of every community, including presumably the yummy mummies with their lavender oil, are going to have to <laughs> publicly have the vaccine and uh, and talk about it. And respected doctors, scientists clinicians from those communities are going to need to take the trouble to listen to people's concerns carefully, respond to them carefully. I mean, nobody gains anything by going around finger wagging and saying, oh, you're just a bunch of nutcases. You know, nobody wants to be told they're a nutcase. People are generally sincere in their viewpoints. And we just have to tackle this with, you know, in a civilized way and explain that the consequences of not having something that has been proven to be safe are very high for you, for your families, for your loved ones and for society at large. And I, I do think that ultimately, I know our government is not going to make vaccines mandatory, not even for healthcare workers, which I think is a real worry. Um, but I do think that 
in that case, the private sector, for example, theatres, cinemas, airlines, cafes, pubs, I do think they are going to have to introduce a policy of if you've got the app on your phone that says you've had the vaccine, you can come in. And if you haven't, you can't, because otherwise it's simply not fair. And the majority of people who have done their civic duty and had the vaccine, I mean, at the, at the moment, we don't know about transmission and vaccines. It looks, for example, as though the Oxford vaccine, which probably will get approval before Christmas, it looks as though that does either slow or stop transmission. We don't yet know about the Pfizer vaccine. The Novovax vaccine, I think, in its early trials, seems to slow or halt transmission. But either way, it's a kind of virtuous circle. So whether or not it halts transmission, if you don't have symptoms, clearly you are less likely to be transmitting it. And I think this is about a social contract, really, and about people saying, yes, I, yes I've done what I need to do to protect myself, but more importantly, I've done what I need to do to protect my fellow citizens. And if you don't sign up to that contract, then unfortunately, you don't have the benefits that some people who have do. Yeah, and I think that uh, the importance of that kind of messaging is, is priceless. And it's got to be about humanity and, and, and kids and your well-being and your fellow human being and people who are older, people who are around you, just people in general. Uh, mm. And the messaging has to be that because, you know, here in the U.S., uh, even Joe Biden, who, uh, thank goodness, is going to be taking the reins from this deranged, um, psychotic fascist that we are swimming through yeah. in the next 31 yeah. or so days. Terrible. Terrible. Yeah, I mean, uh, Biden has been saying things like it's patriotic to to wear a mask, but I don't necessarily think that that's the correct messaging. Uh, it should really be around, you know, your fellow human being um, is the reason, yeah. not because it's patriotic. And if you start to talk about your fellow human being, then you compel people to start really thinking, I hope, mm. about mm -hmm. the consequences of not doing that rather yeah. than saying, well, it's about the flag and it's patriotic. It's called... Patriotism has nothing to do with wanting to save people's lives. It's about yeah. your own humanity and others' humanity around you. Yes, I, I must say, I mean, for me, personal things aside, my two best moments of the year were when it was clear that Biden had won and when the news of the Pfizer vaccine broke, uh, I was dancing around the house. I just thought, there is hope, there is hope. And I think I mean, our political situation is very bad. Um, but yours has been, as you say, fascism is the word. And anyone who's read about the 1930s, I, I recently read a very good book, which I think you, you'd like. It's called The Art of Fairness by a writer called David Badanis. And it's, um, it's about how decent human beings can succeed, which is a message we need to hear now, because unfortunately, a lot of the uh, non-decent human beings have been, particularly in politics, have been the ones who have been more prominent um, in many countries throughout the world, and certainly in yours. And um, about half the book has taken to two case studies. One is um, a shy, young, uh, wannabe writer, the Jewish girlfriend, he wants to write poems and novellas and become a writer. Um, and the other one is about a spoilt young, air, very arrogant, snobbish, and the different directions their lives took. And the second one was FDR, um, who, you know, scion of privilege, who then became one of the most significant uh, presidents in American history and introduced social security and all the things and uh, you know, the New Deal and so many things that were absolutely vital in recent American history. And the other one was Goebbels, uh, who turned from an aspiring poet and uh, novelist to, as we know, the um, chief propagandist of, you know, one of the most evil regimes in global history. And it shows that these things kind of, you know, rest almost on a toss of a coin, that people are not intrinsically good or bad. They can be nudged in one direction or another. But what really chilled me reading about Goebbels was how he used his literary gifts to shift people towards evil, essentially. And I have no admiration for Donald Trump, but anyone looking at him or listening to him over the last few years would have to have some 
admiration, I mean, shocked, horrified, disgusted admiration for his rhetorical gifts, because that is his gift, that somehow or other, he has managed to hoodwink 70 million Americans into thinking that his racist, sexist, misogynistic, fascist message, or which is kind of tied in with this Make America Great slogan, is worth signing up to. And he has done that. And to have actually convinced almost half the American electorate that a democratic election overseen by election observers, including Republican election observers, was stolen. I mean, that is a, re a truly horrifying moment in our history. And it's going to take, I, I think Joe Biden is, is a good man. I'm very relieved that he will be president. Obviously, he's not Obama. I wish he was, but he isn't. Um, but I think he will have his work cut out in trying to tackle the damage that has been done. And of course, uh, now Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will be making history of her own, of course, mm. the first female vice president, the first black woman as vice president, the first South Asian uh, person as vice president. So that's another thing to look forward to in just roughly 31 or 32 days. Um, yes. I do want to ask you about what is going on here with these restrictions and how Boris Johnson, my goodness me, in five days, you know, that the old saying yeah. from Margaret Thatcher, uh, this lady's not for turning. Mm. Um, and now we have Boris Johnson, who's very much for turning. Can you talk yeah. about all of this that's happened? With yeah, this yeah. Stuff? Well, but essentially, last night, Boris Johnson announced that a big swathe of the country would have their Christmas cancelled. We were going to have this in my view, shocking free-for-all in which three households could mix um, freely over five days, which I'm afraid, tragically, was always going to lead to thousands of deaths and to hospitals overflowing in January. Boris Johnson is, um, he's a very complicated person, but I would say one of his most glaring weaknesses is an extraordinary optimism bias. You know, it's kind of magical thinking. It's sort of, if I think it's going to be fine, it will be fine. He, as we know, and your American uh, listeners, viewers may not know, but when it came to the referendum, he didn't have a view one way or the other, the, the uh, EU referendum. He wrote two uh, columns with the opposing points of view, plumped for the one that said, oh, let's leave. Largely, I think, because he knew that that would get him the political heft he needed, and it did. And he subsequently became our prime minister because he supported leave. He, I think, knows in his heart of hearts it's a very bad decision for the UK economically, if nothing else. Um, but he keeps going around even now, even now that we are at very serious threat of no deal with our biggest trading partner. Um, he still said just a few days ago, it will be wonderful. Now, I, I live surrounded by sheep farmers. They will have uh, up to 72 percent tariffs slapped on their meat if they if we crash out without a deal, which we may well do. And if that's the case, then their markets and their work becomes uneconomic straight away. So, you know, they will lose their livelihoods. Many, many, hundreds of thousands of people will lose their livelihoods. And that is not wonderful by most people's definition. But from the beginning of the pandemic, he's had exactly the same point of view. So in the days when he was telling us we should just wash our hands and sing happy birthday, he said, we'll get this done in a few weeks. I mean, he kept saying, oh, in a few weeks, it'll be done. And then by summer, it'll be done. And then by Christmas, it'll be done. And then even knowing that it clearly wasn't going to go away, he still said we could have this free for all over Christmas. And three days ago in the House of Parliament, the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer, was saying to him, look, you know, you've been warned that this is a bad idea. And he said, oh, that's inhuman to cancel Christmas. And uh, he was damning and contemptuous, as he always is. And guess what? Three days later, he has cancelled Christmas. Now, he has had to because the evidence for what will happen is overwhelming. And let's be clear, he's not doing this out of compassion. He's not doing this because he doesn't want people to die. People are dying all the time, and they were certainly going to die on quite a big scale after the Christmas he had planned. He is doing this for one reason only, and that is because the NHS could not cope with the number of deaths that will happen with the rate of infection as it's happening. And the NHS not coping is the PR disaster that no British 
prime minister or government can get away with. To go back to your earlier very kind introduction, um, I did do campaigning about nursing because when I had cancer a couple of times, I didn't have great experience as a nursing. But I, I would like to say, particularly to an American audience, that is not the norm. I mean, our healthcare is very good in this country. Uh, nurses are generally very dedicated, kind people. There are failures in every system. Nurses have been working flat out in the most, and so have doctors, and so have everybody in the healthcare system since March in this country and throughout the world. They all deserve a medal for what they've been doing. I met a very eminent nurse a few months ago for a lunch outside. She's been in one of the Nightingale hospitals uh, built specially for the COVID crisis. And she now had uh, post-traumatic stress disorder because of what she had seen and been through. So Boris Johnson is not doing this because he thinks it'd be bad if people die. He's doing this because the NHS, which has been working incredibly hard and effectively, will collapse if he doesn't do this. And he will not survive politically if that happens. That is the reason. And there, there, a new strain of COVID has been identified. There are variants of viruses all times. And this one apparently is 70% more infectious than the previous strains, which is very worrying. So that's the particular um, trigger for this uh, latest volt fast. Uh, and he was right to make that decision because um, we can't have that degree of uh, infection but what he is wrong to do is to constantly promise that things will be fine and then when it's too late he realizes that he has to actually acknowledge that reality is a thing one one other thing i wanted to ask you is boris johnson because of course you know well and and, and some of the listeners may or may not know that he had started out in the daily telegraph and i think at the times he was fired from the times for plagiarism mm. Um, he had lying, a, lying. For lying. Thank you for correcting mm. me. Um, he had a long career in these columns and the kinds of racist and sexist things he would write. Um, mm. And that had gone on until very recently. Um, mm. Does Boris Johnson just want to be prime minister? Is, yeah. is Because I'm thinking that's exactly what it's about for him. Yes, no, I think, I think that's exactly right. In fact, he said as a child, he said, I want to be world king. And, and the nearest you can probably get to that is being a leader of your own country. I think that is literally the only thing he wanted. And um, he doesn't, he's not a policy person. He doesn't have a strategy. He doesn't have a vision. He doesn't have an aim. His stated aim is to win over the so-called, uh, the northern voters in the so-called Red Wall, who were the people who got him his stonking election victory, a majority of 80 in the elections a year ago. He doesn't have any interest whatsoever in people in northern towns. He is your standard, not your standard, actually. He's your exceptional and exceptionalist member of the English metropolitan elite. You know, he is as privileged as you get. Um, he has got by on charm, which I'm not, uh, I'm completely immune to it, but apparently a lot of people aren't. He's got by on charm, lying, and um, a kind of writing which I don't like. I don't think it's good writing. It's it's full of, it's very polysyllabic. It's full of sort of classical references. It's pretty empty. Uh, he's an, he's an after-dinner speech entertainer, really. But that is not entertaining during a pandemic. Right. Absolutely. Um, oh, my goodness. I, I, I could talk with you for a long time i do want to ask you finally about um, the places where people can uh, contact you obviously you've got a website you've got social media can you say what those are and i'm going to link to all yes. of them in this episode thank you very much well my my website is christinapatterson.co.uk and my email is on that my twitter handle is at queen christina underscore not as people keep telling me because i have delusions of being royal but because Queen Christina my I'm half Swedish and Queen Christina was a very famous uh Swedish queen and I thought it would be funny but clearly that people don't have a sense of humor <laughs> and my Instagram is um at Queen Christina writer wonderful well it's really been a pleasure having you Christina Christina Patterson the writer author broadcaster podcaster activist and so many more things. What a wonderful experience it has been 
to converse with you on this edition of the Politocrat Podcast. Christina, thank you so much. I really do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been a huge pleasure. Special thanks to Christina Patterson. It was really a great pleasure to speak to her and talk about these issues as well as her books. I will be linking to her social media page and her website as well as her podcast, Work Interrupted. Thank you very much for listening to this edition of The Politocrat. I'm Omar Moore.